All right, we're moving on to a new section. This is section 5.2 in your book where we learn about the definite integral. However, in this specific video, we're not going to learn about the definite integral just yet because before we can learn about the definite integral, which will be a fairly interesting topic, by the way, um, we need some framework. We need to kind of set things up a little bit. <clears throat> so I'm going to have a couple videos where I kind of give you some of the groundwork. And this is the first of those videos. And this video, if you want it to be, could be the shortest video of the entire term. All you need to know are these formulas right here. If you want to be like, all right, good, got them, and call this video done, you can do that. Feel free. What I'm going to do is I'm going to explain a little bit more about what these formulas mean, and then I'm going to prove them to you. And you definitely do not need to know <clears throat> how to prove these formulas for this class. It's just really interesting. It's a neat way to prove things called induction that you've probably never seen before and will be really useful in future math classes. But to be clear, you absolutely do not need to know how to prove things by induction for Math 252. So if you're like, I'm overwhelmed right now, I don't have time for your, to listen to you talk about stuff that you just think is interesting, that's not really a part of this course, feel free, end the video, it's okay. Won't hurt my feelings, this is totally optional. All right, that being said, I have these formulas right here. These are the first three versions of what are, of what are called Fallhaber's formula, which just gives you an expression for the sum of natural numbers raised up to any natural number power. Okay, what am I talking about here? This first formula right here is just saying that if you add up a whole bunch of things, that's what sigma means. And what are those sigmas? Well, they only involve an i. And i is the index, it's the thing that's changing. And it changes from one up to n. So in the first copy, if I talk about what the sum from i equals one to n looks like of i, well, in the first copy, I change all the i's into ones. That's all I'm left with. In the second copy, I change all the i's into twos. In the third copy, I change all the i's into threes and so on. And I keep doing that until I get up to whatever n is. This formula is just telling you what the sum of the first n positive whole positive numbers is. That's all this formula is telling you. So like if you really wanted to know what is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10. I right, suppose you were interested in that. Suppose you needed to know what is the sum from i equals 1 to 10 of i. This is just asking you what is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. This is just asking you this. And you could just add up all those numbers if you wanted. Right? It wouldn't take you that long to add up all those numbers since I chose 10. Maybe if I chose 250,000 up here, it would be a little bit more work for you. But with 10, you could just add those all up. But if you didn't want to, you wanted a formula, you could just come over here to this first version of Fallhaber's formula and change all the n's into 10. You're like, well, this formula is claiming that this should be 10 times 10 plus 1, which is 11, over 2. So that 110 divided by 2, this should be equal to 55. And it is. If you add up all these numbers, you'll end up getting 55 as your answer. Anyways, that's all these formulas are telling you. That's all this first formula is telling you, I guess. The second formula is saying that if you have the sum from i equals 1 to n of i squared. So now, this is talking about 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared, and so on, all the way until you get to n squared. Similarly, this is the same idea, except now it's cubed. So maybe for some reason you're interested in figuring out what is the sum of the first, I don't know, 40, it's probably too big of a number, squared whole numbers. What's well, 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared all the way up to 40 squared. All right, this would be a lot of work. You could figure it out with your calculator if you really wanted to, but you don't have to because the second version of Fallhaber's formula will do it for you. It will just say that is this with 40s in place of all the ends. So 40 times 41 times 81 divided by 6. And I don't think I can do that in my head, but Google tells me it's 22,140. Similarly, you could use this formula here if you're interested in the sum of a bunch of cubes instead of a bunch of squares. Anyways, that's what these formulas do. And it turns out these formulas will be really important for figuring out the definite integral. So I wanted to provide them to you. What I now want to do is I want to prove that, I don't know, maybe I'll pick one of these, prove that one or two of these formulas are true. And I want to prove them by induction. And again, this is the part that's completely optional, but I personally think it's really, really interesting. Let's pick on this first one here. Suppose that I want to prove that the sum of the first n positive whole numbers is just equal to n times n plus 1 over 2. There's a few different ways you can prove this. There's an interesting one called Gauss's method that there's kind of a little folklore behind. Supposedly, when Gauss was a young kid, he came up with this idea. <clears throat> Doesn't matter. That's not what I'm doing here. I want to prove this, but I want to do it by what's called induction. 
And to do it by induction, what you have to think about is that this is actually a really powerful statement, right? This is saying that if I add up the first n whole numbers, I have this formula for it for any value of n. Right? I could check this for specific values of n. Like I could make n equal to 10 like I did over here and then just add up the first 10 whole numbers and check that the sum of those first 10 whole numbers really is 10 times 11 divided by two. And it is, right? I've already checked this for 10, but that doesn't prove this statement. That only proves this statement for one value of n. What I have to do is prove this statement for all values of n. There's infinitely many values of n because there's infinitely many positive whole numbers for which my sequence could go up to. So that might seem impossible, like you could check one version, you could check two if you have a lot of time, if you have a computer or something, you could check a million versions but there's infinitely many whole numbers. How could you ever prove something is true for infinitely many whole numbers? It's a really clever technique for how you do it. And it's a two-step process when you're doing induction. Step one is called the induction step. And this one's really clever. What you're gonna do here is you're gonna assume that this formula is true for some specific value of n, right? So not for all of them, but for one specific value of n, right? Pro you're gonna assume that the sum from i equals one all the way up to, maybe I'll call it the letter k of i is equal to, well, let's see, if the n were a k, the formula is telling me this should be k times k plus one divided by two, right? So maybe in your head you're thinking k is 49 million. We're gonna assume that the formula is true for 49 million, All right? So we're just gonna pretend it's true, which seems like a really, really weird thing to do in a proof, but don't worry, this is gonna end up working. We don't know that this is true, but we're gonna assume it is. And then what we'll do is show that if this really is true, and again, we don't know that it's true, but if it is, then the formula must also be true if I stop one higher, right? So again, in your head, maybe you're pretending this K is 49 million. If this formula is true for 49 million, I'm gonna show algebraically that it must be true for 49 million and one. I'm gonna show that if it's true for any specific value of n, I'll use k to represent that, then it must be true for the very next value of n, k plus one here. I'm gonna algebraically show that that's true. And just to be clear here, I'm gonna show that this implies this. That will not mean that this is true because I, already, I don't even know that this one is true. Right? But if I could somehow figure out that this one was true, then that would mean that this one is true. So I'm gonna assume that this first statement is true and then I'm gonna show how that implies that this second statement is true. And that might seem really hard to do, but it's not as hard as maybe you'd think, right? Because I'm assuming that this is true, I can start out with an equation. I can say that the sum from i equals one to k of the letter i is equal to k times k plus one over two. Right? I'm assuming this is true, so I can write this equality. But what I wanna show is that the sum from i equals one to k plus one of i equals this. Well, if you think about this compared to this, they're almost the same. This one is one plus two plus three plus four plus five all the way up to k. And this one is one plus two plus three plus four plus five all the way up to k plus one. So this is some really, really long sum. This is the exact same sum with one extra number added into the end, this k plus one. So if I wanted to have information about this one, I could start out with this one and just add k plus one to it, right? I could take the sum from i equals one to k of i, this thing right here, and then I could add k plus one to that. But if I add k plus one to one side of the equation, I also have to add k plus one to the other side of the equation. All right? don't let all these symbols throw you off. I had this formula, I'm saying this mess right here is equal to this mess right here. Think about in algebra, if you have something equals something else and you wanna add 48 to both sides of the equation, you feel free. It's fine. If this is the same as this, then 48 more than this is 48 more than this. I'm just not adding 48, I'm adding this k plus one thing to both sides of the equation. What I now have on the left-hand side is the sum from i equals one to k plus one of i. And make sure you could talk yourself into that. If you could talk yourself into that, you really understand what this symbol means. In case I've lost people, here are some arrows. The sum from i equals one to k of i is this thing in red. I'm adding to that k plus one, which is shown in green. What I now have in total is the sum from one all the way up to k plus one, which is exactly this down here. So what I have on the left-hand side is the sum from i equals one to k plus one of i. What do I have on the right-hand side of the equation? Well, I have a big mess, but maybe I can simplify that mess a little bit. I mean, maybe I can rewrite this in such a way that it looks just like this, because if I could get it to look like this, I will have shown 
that if the original premise is true, then this statement is true. Well, let's see. What I have right here, is that the same as this? If I wanted to figure it out, I suppose that I should get a common denominator. I should do some algebra here. Since this is all divided by two, I should divide this by two. So I got 2k plus two over two. I make this over one and multiply the top and the bottom by two. And now that I have a common denominator here, I can add up the numerators. There's a slick way where you can factor this, but I think most students will, might have a hard time seeing that and I don't wanna disguise anything from you. So what I'm gonna ex instead do is expand everything out here. So I'll call this k squared plus k when I take the k and distribute it through the parentheses. And then I'm gonna to add to that 2k plus two, which is what I have over in the numerator here. And the whole thing's divided by two. And now what I have is this polynomial k squared plus 3k plus 2 up in the numerator, and that's divided by 2. And maybe you're really good at factoring from your algebra days, factoring quadratic trinomials when the leading coefficient is 1. Maybe you recognize that you really just need two numbers that multiply to 2 and add to 3. Maybe you're thinking like k plus 2 and k plus 1 would do the trick, and it does. And so look at what we came up with here. I have that the sum from i equals 1 to k plus 1 of i is equal to this thing. This is exactly what I was trying to show. And you're like, oh, okay, cool. You proved that this formula is true in the k plus 1 case. No, I did not. I proved that if it's true in the k case, then it's true in the k plus 1 case. But I still don't know it's true in the k case. I just assumed that. I made that up out of nowhere. Nobody has shown that this is true for some arbitrary number k. But if it is true for some arbitrary number k, then it's true for k plus 1. If it turns out that this formula is true when n up here equals a million, then it turns out that the formula must always also be true when n equals a million and 1. But I don't know that the formula is true for a million and 1 because at this point I don't know that the formula is true for a million. But I'm done with step 1, the induction step. Step 1, the induction step, will assume that the formula is true for some value of k and show that that implies that the formula is true for k plus 1. Turns out that I'm almost done. Step 2 is really easy. In step 2, what I have to do is prove the base case. What do I mean by the base case? Take the smallest possible value for n and just check it by hand. Just check that one. So I guess if n were just equal to 1, I could have the sum from i equals 1, just up to 1 of i. Wait, so what is this doing here? This is saying add up all the whole numbers starting at 1. And once you get to 1, you're done. This is just going to be equal to 1. And this better be the same as, well, the formula tells me if n is 1, I should have 1 times 1 plus 1 over 2. 1 times 2 over 2, that does equal 1. What I just did is I proved the base case. I proved that this formula holds true when n equals 1. You're like, all right, I still don't quite get it. We're done. If this formula is true when n equals 1, and I know that if the formula is true when n equals 1, then it must be true when n equals 2. By checking that it's true when n equals 1, I've proven that it's true when n equals 2. You're like, great, so you have 1 and 2. What is that 2? Well, I get 3 for free. Because 1 proves that 2 is true, and now that 2 is true, that proves that 3 is true. And now that 3 is true, that proves that 4 is true. And now that 4 is true, you kind of get the point. right? Because if this is true for any given value, then it must be true for the next value. By showing that it's true for the smallest value that makes sense, it shows that it's true for all values. I now know that this formula must be true for any value of n using this really clever method called induction. Now you've seen induction. You can use induction to prove the rest of these formulas as well. Sure, I'll do the next one. Why not? Here's my statement. When you're proving something by induction, typically you tell the reader, hey, I'm going to prove this by induction so that they can kind of follow your logic. You usually don't write step one. You just say, you just start with your assumption here. So I say, assume that the sum from i equals 1 to k of i squared equals this thing. Assume this is true. This, assume the formula holds true for some value. I don't know that it does, but just assume it does. Don't worry, I'll take care of that later. Then what do I want to do to change this from the k case to the k plus 1 case? Well, I guess I would add k plus 1 squared to both sides of the equation. Do you have a hard time seeing that? You could write it this way. You could expand this sigma notation just to make life a little bit easier for the reader so that now when you add k plus 1 squared to both sides, it's obvious what you're doing. 
I can now change this back into sigma notation just so it's clear to the reader that what I have over here is the sum from i equals 1 to k plus 1 now <clears throat> of i squared. And then on the right-hand side, all I have to show is that this is the same as this if you change all the n's into k plus 1. I should probably show a few steps algebraically. There's a couple different ways you can do this. I'm going to follow a similar step or strategy to what I did last time. First, get a common denominator, so multiply this by 6 over 6. Um, and now maybe since these polynomials are going to get kind of ugly, you might recognize that you really only have two terms. You have all of these multiplied together and then all of this multiplied together. And each of those terms has a k plus 1 in them. So I could factor out that k plus 1. And now what I'm left with over here is k times 2k plus 1. And what I'm left with over here is 6 times the other k plus 1. All right, that might take a minute. That algebra is a little bit advanced, but hopefully you can follow that. All I'm doing is taking this k plus 1 and one of these k plus 1s and writing it right here. I'm factoring out that k plus 1. And that leaves me with the k times the 2k plus 1 over here. And it leaves me with 6 times the remaining k plus 1 over here. This part's kind of already dealt with because I, I know what I want my answer to look like, right? I want it to sort of look like this, except in place of all of the ends, I want a k plus 1. So the k plus 1, this n that turns into a k plus 1 will end up being this guy right here. I should have a k plus 2, k plus 1 plus 1. And then this 2 times k plus 1 plus 1 more. And I think I can get that if I kind of expand things out here and then factor. Let's see, if I distribute this k through, I would get 2k squared plus k. If I just take this and hit these two terms. And then over on this side, I would get 6k plus 6. And so if I combine like terms, the k and the 6k gives me 7k. And now what I want to try to do is factor this thing. And you could just take a look at it and just try to factor if you're good with factoring. Uh, let's see, k plus 2, I think, will be one of the factors. And 2k plus 3, I think, will be the other factor. Don't believe me? k times 2k gives me the 2k squared. 2 times 3 gives me the 6. And here's 4 of the k's, and here's the remaining 3k's that give me this 7k here. All right, so you could factor this thing to make it equal to this, and that gets you this 6 right here. And then if you want to make it really clear to the reader what's going on here, I don't even know if you have to do this last step, but you could write, rewrite k plus 2 as k plus 1 plus 1, and you could rewrite 2 times k plus 3 as 2 times k plus 1 plus 1. And that's all divided by 6. And why would you want to write it in this form? Well, because now it's really obvious to the reader if you stare at this, n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1, and change all those n's into k plus 1's, here's your k plus 1, here's the old n, which is now k plus 1 plus 1, and here's the old n, so it used to be 2n plus 1, and now it's 2k plus 1 plus 1. In other words, if this is true, when n equals k, which I don't know what it is, I don't know what it is, but if it are, is, then it must be true when n equals k plus 1. All that's left to do now is to show the base case. Since that's so trivial, often it's written like, note, if n equals 1, and then I can kind of copy this formula, the sum from i equals 1 to 1 of i squared would just be 1 squared. And my formula is telling me that that should be equal to 1 times 1 plus 1 times 2 times 1 plus 1 divided by 6. So what I've done here is step 1, I have this induction step all the way up to here. Step 2, I've shown that it's true for my base case. And so now if you want to really put a bow on this thing, you could say like, therefore, by the principle of mathematical induction, and then write your original claim. I don't know. This is just one of these things that people often write at the end of their proofs just to try to look smart. Sometimes you'll throw like a QED at the end if you're really trying to show off. Anyways, that's kind of what a proof would look like if you're doing a proof by induction.